Thank you, Judy. Good morning and welcome to worship at Our Savior's Lutheran. I'm Pastor Virgette Weir and it's a joy to be in worship together here on Zoom or on Facebook or if you're watching us later on YouTube. We've got it all. We're just digital. Um, and so as we start our time together, a couple of reminders. One is to please remain muted um, as that helps with the sound and with the, um, with the noise level. And we are looking for worship leaders this morning. If you would like to read our prayer of the day, which is called prayer of illumination in this liturgy or the um, Exodus or first Corinthians text or help with the prayers of the people or the affirmation of faith, please put it in the chat what you would like to do and don't be shy. You can download our bulletin at oslcslc.org. I will also share my screen here in a moment. And you can also, with the bulletin, with our order of worship, is a devotional for the week, as well as our calendar of events. Please look at the calendar of, a bit of events and know that you are welcome to anything and everything. Okay, y'all, I have a lot of announcements. So buckle up because we're headed into Easter. So that means there's lots going on, which is pretty exciting. So a couple of things next week. So I should say, starting on the 15th of March 15th, I am taking a week off. So there will not be a pre-recorded for the week of the 21st. And you will have Pastor Paul Judson from Colorado State University Campus Ministry, who will be leading you in this Zoom worship at 10 a.m. on Sunday, March 21st. So there will only be Zoom that weekend. And then once I'm back on Monday, I will be able to upload it to YouTube um, and I'll see about if we can get it live streamed. But there will be worship March 21st, but I will be off the week before that. For the Wednesday night of that week, which I believe is March 17th, St. Patty's Day, Dave Allen and Bill Hooper will be leading us through, worship, through Vespers that evening. On Holy Week, starting March 28th, we will have Stations of the Cross that you will be able to experience. They will be inside at Our Saviors. So we will be sending out signups, a sign up genius, where your household, whoever lives with you in your house, will be able to experience those um, Stations of the Cross on half hour increments. Um, we have some time set aside that Sunday, March 28th, through Holy Saturday, April 3rd, about three hours at a time. Um, and But the, the signups for the stations are half an hour each. I am also looking for hosts to host at that time. We'll be sending that sign up out as well. So for instance, I'm hosting Thursday and Monday, Thursday, and the time is two to five. So I will be at church to do some cleaning, to help people to make sure things run smoothly as people come in to experience Stations of the Cross. And if you volunteer to be a host, I will gladly offer just the little bit of training you need. It won't be hard. So that's holy. That's for one thing for Holy Week. On Wednesday of Holy Week, I will be offering on Zoom bread baking with Pastor Bridget, and I will be teaching you my favorite flatbread communion bread recipe that you can use for either Holy uh, for Monday Thursday or for Easter Sunday worship. Monday Thursday and Good Friday will be on Zoom at 7 p.m. Easter will be 10 a.m. in person on the West Lawn. Woohoo! I know, right? Can I get a holy woohoo? Yes. And we will be live streaming onto YouTube at that point. So if you are unable to join us on the lawn, you can still at 10 o'clock go to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe and you'll be able to watch us live and we will be able, we will upload it later for you to watch as well. So that is really exciting. A reminder that we will have Wednesday Vespers again at 7 p.m. this week on Zoom. 
And we will be having a celebration of life for June Garrity on Zoom, March 25th, Thursday at 5.30 p.m. So look for more information for the celebration of life for June Garrity. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention on Easter at a, after worship, probably around 11, we're going to be doing an Easter egg hunt for the, for the children. So I know, so cool. So we have that COVID safe and ready to go. Um, and so Melinda's asking, yes, we will be permanently on the lawn. Nothing's permanent. We'll be on the lawn for a while um, until we can go inside. So, um, so yes, 10 o'clock on the lawn. And um, from here on out, if the weather's bad, bring a coat and we'll be fine. Um, and I guess unless it blizzards and then we'll, we'll deal with that. So yes, we will be together again. Reminds me of the Muppets song. All right. So please make a note. If you would like to participate in worship, um, please put it in the chat. I know a few of you have, and let's take a moment as we center ourselves for worship this morning. Please join me for the call to worship. I will share my screen. Again and again, we come to this space. Again and again, we gather as a community Again and again, we move closer to God. Again and again, God is here. We are met. We are heard. We are shown the way. So again and again, let us worship holy God. And we come now to our time of confession. Science tells us that a person makes about 35,000 choices in a day. Every day, 35,000 choices. In the prayer of confession, we pause to take a moment to think and to ask how many of our decisions are choices God would have us make? How many are not? So let us pray together, knowing that we need guidance and trusting that even if we fall, God is showing us the way. Please join me in our prayer of confession. God of justice, we are guilty of building tables. We have built tables that oppression dines on. Sexism thrives on and racism lives on. God of justice, we are guilty of forgetting where we are, of turning faith into a negotiation tool and the church into a place for insiders. God of justice, we are guilty of ignoring the point. For as for you taught that the temple was for worship and your message was for all. God of our hearts, be in our decision making. Draw near to our choices. Forgive our mistakes. And as you do, flip every table, habit, belief, or point of view that needs adjusting. With hope, we pray for a better day. Amen. Family of faith, the good news is that God took on flesh and walked this earth to show us the way. God took on flesh so that we could see what it looks like to disrupt and overturn systems of corruption. God took on flesh to teach us another way. God took on flesh to point us to restoration. God took on flesh so that we might be forgiven. Friends, we are held, loved, and forgiven by a just and merciful God. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Our hymn of the day is hymn 324, verses 1, 2, and 3, in the cross of Christ I glory.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Deb, will you please pray for us? Creator God, we don't just want to listen, we want to hear you. We want to read scripture aloud and know that you are as close as you have always been. We want to read scripture aloud and feel your word resonating inside our bones. We want to read scripture aloud and have your words stuck in our heads like a melody falling off of our lips like a love song. Creator God, we don't just want to listen, we want to hear you, so turn our hearts toward you. Just as you turned strangers into disciples, turn our ears toward you. Just as you turn tables in the temple, we are listening. Amen. 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 Bill, will you please read our Exodus story for today? I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. Six, but, but six doesn't be in there. But showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover, covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Bertram, will you read for us our first Corinthians passage? <clears throat> now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, for all of you to be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you say, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas. Hey, Bertram, I think you might be reading the wrong. What? I'm sorry. It's... Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it said 10, not 18. No, nope, it's um, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. And it's on my screen, too, if that helps. Okay, I'll read it from there. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. To us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. 
but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and, Gen and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Bertram. Our that. gospel acclamation is um, comes from our All Creation Sings. Judy will play the line once, right. and then we will all join in. According to John, the second chapter, glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Don't know if we have any children present today, but I, this is kind of a fun thing that I have always loved. So what, what word is this? Wow, right? And it means like, it can mean wonder or fear or joy and, and right? So it has a specific meaning, but what happens if I turn it upside down? You look at it from, it says mom, which means something completely different than, Wow. Now, sometimes you might say, wow, mom, or mom, wow. You might do that, right? But when we flip something, it means something different. When we see something from a different angle, we get a different meaning. Sometimes our lives are like that, or at least mine is. Sometimes I need to see things in a different way. And that's what our Bible story is about. Jesus came into the temple and started flipping over tables. He was mad. Jesus gets mad. God gets mad. God only gets mad when we're doing things that might harm somebody else because God wants everyone to be safe. And Jesus wanted people to wanted everyone in the temple to see that some people were being treated poorly. And so he flipped things over so that people could see differently how we should live together. And so our lives are like that too. Jesus kind of comes into our lives and flips things over. So we see things differently. Jesus wants us to see everybody, how Jesus sees them as people to love. And God wants us to see creation as creation, God's creation to love. Sometimes we have a hard time seeing that, don't we? So we might have to look at things differently. We might have to look behind or underneath or on top of, right? If you look at a rock, it might have different colors underneath than it does on top. So we need to look at things differently. 
And that's what our Bible story is about today. And good, but we need to remember that what God wants us to always see is God's love and grace. And then for us to see that we can be that love and grace in the world. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And hopefully you'll be able to offer some insights to the adults, because I know you all are very good at seeing things differently. And so this week, and actually our young friends will, re will know, this is Read Across America Month, the month of March. And on March 2nd, I was invited to read books to Mrs. Walker's kindergarten class at Mill Creek Elementary via Zoom, of course. And that was on March 2nd, which is when Dr. Seuss's birthday is. And many of you know, I was an early childhood educator long before I was a pastor, and I have celebrated Dr. Seuss's birthday by reading his books to his students for years. And originally, I had thought I would read one this year to the kindergartners. And then you might have heard some information has surfaced in the last few weeks that made me rethink what I might read to the kindergartners. It's come to light that Theodore Giesel, a, a, AKA Dr. Seuss, has a pretty lengthy history of fairly racist and derogatory behavior, and that many of his book characters are based on those stereotypes of Black people. I'm going to be honest and transparent here. My first reaction was a deep sigh. <sighs> now, no Dr. Seuss? So, and, okay, what is this cancel culture? Is it run amok? But then I reflected. I listened to people of color and to all perspectives, and I realized those things are indeed offensive, racist, and I believed those perspectives. I did not read a Dr. Seuss book on Tuesday, but I read a book over in the meadow with the illustrations by Ezra Jack Keats, who is a person of color instead. You see, I listened, I learned, and I made a different choice, even though I wasn't immediately comfortable with it, but I realized it wasn't just about my comfort. It was about the comfort and the dignity and humanity of my Black siblings and their lives, their experiences, and their justice in a nation that often negates or tries to cancel them as human beings. For years, I had just accepted Dr. Seuss, a white author, as the norm, and I didn't question it. But then when that was flipped over, turned upside down, I saw something different. I saw something that was indeed true and it was indeed perpetuating harm and I needed to take another action. As I told the kids there, if I'm honest, there are so many areas of my life where I don't question and I just accept. And then my perspective is flipped over. It makes me uncomfortable and yeah, sometimes defensive. I don't like to think I could be wrong. Right now, we're in many societal debates about many long held ideas and concepts that need to be flipped because it turns out they are indeed harmful and derogatory. They always have been, but now we see them differently. Maybe it's learning about Dr. Seuss inherent racism or a pancake company changing their logo and name or companies that are committed to no longer using women as objects to sell products. Or again, as I learned some years ago that it is, it's not a, it's harmful to only refer to God as male as it perpetuates sexism and homophobia and our theological thinking. And it leads to women, fems and young girls, including myself, to assume that we are not created in God's image if we always refer to God as male. And as I mentioned, some people are calling this cancel culture. Cancel culture isn't new and no, it's not actually canceling anything. It's reflecting on new information and then making better decisions. Maya Angelou famously once said, when you know better, you do better. It's okay to say, I didn't know that, but now I do. And now I'll change my language behavior and thoughts so that I don't cause harm to my siblings so that I set them free for flourishing. 
it's hard because we don't want to change and do better even when we know better. And we often don't until it's our only option. It's easier to just ignore what needs to be changed, particularly if it doesn't affect us and we just go along to get along. We forget that we're interconnected and what harms one will eventually harm us all. We forget that it matters that we make better decisions with the new information we learn so that our neighbor is also secure, safe, and loved. The Israelite people, turns out, also had a rough history of this knowing better and then doing better, like every other human group in history. God had freed them from slavery, gave them food and water in the desert, protected them, and still they squabbled among themselves and tried taking more than what they needed. So God decided, I need to offer these people some boundaries, some guidelines of how to live with God and with one another. God wanted to instruct them on how to live in such a way that offered safety, dignity, honor, and flourishing. God wanted them to know better, so they could do better. Well, even while Moses was up the mountain getting the Ten Commandments from God, the people, as you might recall, built a golden calf to worship down below. I mean, seriously, it took about 2.2 seconds for the people to grow restless and decide they could figure out life together better than God. So fast forward that 800 years, and the same was still true in Jesus' time. The Israelites had rebuilt the temple after exile and then had created this whole temple worship a festival ritual and purification that they thought was wise and beneficial. I mean, beneficial, sure, if you were the temple authorities or the money changers or the sacrificial animal vendor. But if you were poor from outside Jerusalem and simply trying to be an observant Jew, not so much. The system was not set up to benefit you. It was set up to take advantage of your love of God, of your desire to do the right thing. It was set up to put a barrier between you and God and remind you that you need to be at the right place at the right time with the right things to experience God's presence. They should have known better, but they didn't. They bought, literally bought into their own ideas about how God and religion worked they needed to be shaken up to see the system for what it really was so they could see who God really is. Jesus saw this happening and it, how it was canceling what God truly wants. And yeah, as I told the kids, it made Jesus angry. Jesus' anger is not out of hate or exclusion, but exasperation and love for the people who should know better. It must have been frightening for some people to see Jesus enter with a whip. And to be clear, it was for the animals, not the people. To see his anger, to kick over tables, to pour the money all over the floor, release the animals for sacrifice, and declare that this is not how you build a relationship with God. God is not the temple. God is with them wherever they are, as evidenced by Jesus. The money changing is canceled. Buying animals for sacrifice is canceled. Worrying if you're pure enough for the temple is canceled. The idea of God only in the temple, canceled. What isn't canceled is God's promise of renewing the people's hearts, minds, and souls so that God's beloved community the, with the world will also know better than to harm, oppress, or marginalize anyone for any reason. What isn't canceled is God's desire to be with God's people wherever they are without, boundary, uh, without barriers. What wasn't canceled was God's inclusion of all people into God's grace, love, mercy, and hope. This challenge to the temple system, the religious system, the way it had always been, the way it had been set up by the people would mean changes for those with power and privilege. They wouldn't have liked it. They would have pushed back complaining that their livelihoods, their beliefs that were being negated, oppressed, or canceled. But Jesus didn't have any of that. No, your oppression and power over other people isn't your right. It's not your entitlement. God is creating something new, a new way to be in the world and what it'll mean that we have created as humans will need to be turned over. Because what Jesus knew is that there are so many tables 
in our world that do need to be turned over so we can see things differently. We need to turn over the tables of our capitalistic culture that lie to us that more stuff is security and money is power. We need to turn over the tables of homophobia and transphobia to see that our siblings are that our siblings are being re, uh, are being rejected their human and civil rights. We need to turn over the tables of sexism and misogyny that objectifies women and disallows women agency and autonomy over their own bodies. We need to turn over the tables of using religion and the Bible as a weapon to keep certain populations in a marginalized place or to perpetuate hierarchy. We need to turn over the tables so we see life with one another, how God sees life all together. You see, Jesus didn't come to keep us comfortable, but to reveal that when God is with us, our tables are turned over so we can see the truth of what's underneath. And once we see it, once we know it, we will do better. Our baptismal journey, my friends, is to keep turning over the tables of status quo, comfort, and security in our lives to see differently, to see from God's perspective, to see the new thing that God is creating. We are called to keep learning, to keep digging deeper, to keep questioning, and to keep doing better. We will be different from other people in the world who will call us foolish or weak, as Paul says but we trust in the wisdom and strength of God flipping over what doesn't bring flourishing and life abundant to all people and all creation. We cling to the promise that God's love, grace, mercy, and hope are never canceled and our lives are turned over to see that truth. Amen. Our hymn of the day is Change My Heart, O God. And just so that to be clear, we'll sing it all the way through and then we'll go back and sing the refrain to the end. lead us in the affirmation of faith. We believe in a God who knows holy rage, a God who stands with the underdog, who passionately protects the suffering, and who overturns systems of corruption. We believe in a God who leads by example, feeding the hungry, welcoming the children, offering water to the Samaritan, eating with the tax collector, healing the sick, preaching from the mountaintop, and offering second chances. We believe in a God who knew that we would lose our way and still said, this is my body broken for you. We believe in a God who knew our capacity for mistakes and still said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And because of this love, we believe that God shows us the way again and again and again. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
the peace of Christ be with you all and also with you. Come to this point of worship for our time of generosity where we, re, we acknowledge and give thanks to God for everything that God has so generously given us. As a response to that, we have an opportunity for offering. You can go on our website, oslcslc.org, to contribute to our ministries. We are still collecting food. Well, still, we will always, for the long future, hopefully, be collecting food for the Mill Creek Elementary Pantry that gets delivered once a week, non-perishable food items. And they also could use um, cl new clothes for children and adults. Toiletries are also really helpful. So you can drop those off in the, in the bins that we have outside the doors at Our Saviors, and we will get that to Mill Creek. And together, we support so many in our community. You can go on our website and see all the ways that we are indeed a spirit-filled community reaching out and caring for all. Thank you for supporting our ministry. Deb, I, I had thought you had meant prayers, the prayer of the day, but you had um, volunteered for prayers of the people. So thank you for jumping in. And will you please also lead us in prayers for the people? And I will do the your weakness is stronger paragraph and add in. If you have prayer requests you would like prayed out loud, please put them in the chat. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. The heavens declare your glory, renew your creation, provide leaders in the struggle for clean air and water, protect creatures and crops that rely on healthy ecosystems, give all people the willingness to repent when our way of life pollutes the earth and skies. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill leaders with the foolishness of your peace and mercy. Your law defends the vulnerable. Work through legislators, judicial systems, and systems of law enforcement to protect the well being and freedom of all, especially people who are targeted by prejudice, hate, and injustice. Hear us, O God. Your mercy, mercy is, is great. great. God, your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who suffer. We particularly pray today for Lisa, Caleb, Jeff, Kinzen, Melanie, for Frank, for Tess, and for Robin's brother, Rick. And for all who are impacted by COVID-19, God, we pray that we learn to care for one another and the earth. And now we pray for those whom we lift up in our hearts or out loud with our voices. Give Sabbath rest to all who labor. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You call us to proclaim Christ crucified. Give clarity to this congregation and our leaders so that we might follow Christ beyond our own habits and comforts. Clear out anything in our common life that would obscure the gospel or that serves our own interests. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We come now to Holy Communion, to where we flip over any ideas we might have of isolation, of autonomy, and know that we are indeed connected. We are remembered into the body of Christ through Christ's very body and blood. All you need is some uh, bread or a piece of cracker or some wine or grape juice and to know that this table of grace, love, mercy, and abundance extends to you, to where you are always. No one is excluded. And we hear again the story of Jesus celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples in that upper, in that upper room in Jerusalem, a meal that tasted like freedom, that tasted like grace, and it's the night that Jesus would be betrayed. And he took the bread 
and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, Jesus took the cup and blessed it and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And gathered as one people by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now together we will receive the body of Christ given for you. the blood of Christ shed for you. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forevermore. Amen. Our sending hymn is hymn number 547, Send Me Jesus. You will notice verses three and four are simply printed out here. And have a little fun with it, if we can do that in Lent. I want to play it through all the way once before we start. As you leave this space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk toward justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. May this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. In the name of the lover and of the beloved and of love itself, go with courage, go with heart, go in peace. Amen, and thanks be to God. Thank you for joining us for worship today. We pray it was a blessing, and we pray to always be willing to be flipped by God's love and grace. Have a wonderful week. I am stopping the live stream.